So for our Lucy Davidovich lecture this year, Dr. Bergwitz is going to rely on her experience as professor at Barnard and uh, her being the Renner, Renner Chair of Jewish Studies, in addition to her being a professor of Talmud and Rabbinics at the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. Uh, she's held postdoctoral fellowships in Yale University's program in Jewish Studies, the University of Pennsylvania's Katz Center for Advanced Jewish Studies, and New York University's Law School's Tikva Center for Law and Jewish Civilization. I came to know her work because of her fantastic book, Animals and Animality in the Babylonian Talmud, which uh, is, is an interest of ours in our Talmud class. And so we use your source as the, you know, beyond Rashi resources, Dr. Berkowitz. And we go beyond Rashi and beyond the page and, and really bring to life the pages based on some of your fantastic commentary about our most sacred Talmudic literature. I want to thank Mark Ashley and the programming committee. Mark for his, not only his article and the newsletter describing this lecture, but for uh, his engagement with the material that was sent around. And, and Dr. Berkowitz, we're, we're, we're again so delighted to have you here. In a moment, Dr. Berkowitz will be sharing her screen. I'll be spotlighting her video. And you can hover your cursor up to the upper right-hand corner, at least it is on my screen. And where it says speaker view, if you click it, you will be able to see Dr. Berkowitz's shared screen and her picture alone. And that will make for, I think, an engaging way of hearing her lecture and seeing her on your screen. Adjust your system volume as is necessary, as I cannot adjust any volume. And a reminder that you can use the chat below. And if you hover over the bottom and you get the little chat bubble, you can put comments and questions into the chat so that we're not interrupting Dr. Berkowitz's presentation. And uh, at times she might invite interaction and we'll move back to this gallery view again by clicking that upper right hand corner and going to the gallery view so you can see lots of people and faces. Dr. Berkowitz, all yours and delighted to have you here. Thanks so much, Rabbi Bolton. Um, I really want to thank you for inviting me to be here this evening. Um, as Rabbi Bolton said, we met at the birthday party of Sarah Clagburn at our um, mutual friends slash congregants and Eric Weinstein, and I'm so glad I got to meet him then. And that that conversation has led to this evening and I'm just um, really pleased to be here to see you all and to get a chance to learn with you tonight. I also want to thank Mark Ashley whom I spoke with and who helped to organize this evening. So, um, so I'm really happy to be here and I will start by sharing my screen. Okay, so can everyone see the screen? Great. Um, so first, actually, I, I wanted to ask in the chat if you could, if you could tell me, has anyone here adopted a dog in the past year? That's great, that's even better. So someone fostered a dog two years ago, Eric um, got a dog. So, uh, so I'm sure a lot of you have heard that this past year, has, there's been um, just a huge number of adoptions of dogs. Um, people are at home more, people also want to get out more. People are seeking companionship and connection. Um, so I actually had a dog before the pandemic also. His name is Bert. Um, uh, let me show you a picture of Bert. He is a Newfoundland. He's big and fuzzy and he looks like a bear. 
and he gets a huge amount of attention wherever we go. And people's response to him is really interesting. People assume he's just this big old cuddly teddy bear. So he can be very sweet, but the reality is actually more complicated. Bird has actually gotten into numerous dog fights. He's sometimes aggressive towards people if he's scared, like skateboarders. Um, he'll bark and growl menacingly at them, which of course makes me feel terrible. Um, so it's that disconnect between the reality and the perception that I wanted to delve into with you tonight. If Bert had lived in the late 1800s, he would have faced a very different reality. So Newfoundlands were popular at the time, but as garb dogs, they were one of the first breeds registered by the newly formed American Kennel Club in 1886. They had a reputation for aggression. Newspapers featured dramatic stories in which there were fatal Newfoundland attacks. There was one account from 1893 where a 14-year-old boy in Cincinnati kicked a Newfoundland and the Newfoundland responded by attacking the boy and tragically killing him. But as you probably know, the pit bull is the dog now that people are most afraid of and that's associated with danger. Many cities have pit bull bans. The entire United Kingdom banned pit bulls in 1991. But these sorts of breed targeting laws have actually shown not to be very effective and have actually been challenged as unconstitutional. Dog bites don't seem to decrease as a consequence of these breed-specific bans. What seems to do the trick more is education of dog owners, regulation, and it's also a lot more cost-efficient since impounding a lot of pit bulls is very costly. Um, now, breed-based discrimination also has racial overtones, which I wanted to talk about a little bit. So there's an essay I assign in my animal studies course at Barnard, and it's called Golden Retrievers are White, Pit Bulls are Black, Chihuahuas are Hispanic. And the author looks at pop culture phenomena like L.L. Bean ads that feature Golden Retrievers, or you probably saw the Taco Bell ads that featured chihuahuas. Um, and the article shows how our ideas about white and black and brown people are shaped and reinforced by associations with dog breeds. And this phenomenon, I think, recently has become quite famous in the ad that Senator Raphael Warnock used in his campaign, in which he portrays himself with a beagle. So in case you have not seen that ad or read about it, I thought I would show it to you so you get a sense of um, the kinds of issues I'm talking about with respect to, let's see if I can get it to run. Sometimes these things don't work the way they are supposed to. Let's see. Uh, um, Okay, I think I may have to just describe the video to you. How many people saw the video? Did a fair number? Let's see. Okay, so in the ad, you see Senator Raphael Warnock, or you know, then uh, running for Senator Raphael Warnock, walking his beagle. Ah, here it goes. Just took a while. Okay, let's listen. We told them the smear ads were coming, and that's exactly what happened. You would think that Kelly Leffler might have something good to say about herself if she really wants to represent Georgia. 
Instead, she's trying to scare people by taking things I've said out of context from over 25 years of being a pastor. But I think Georgians will see her ads for what they are. Don't you? I'm Raphael Warnock, and we approve this message. Okay. I knew that was going to play again. Okay. Uh, we're going to get to this slide in a minute. But let me talk to you um, for now about this video. So an article on the website 538 commented on this video saying, Warnock's Beagle can be thought of as trying to communicate a specific white friendly message to voters. Something like, how can I be the scary black guy she's depicting with a dog like that? Warnock's dog ads may well be thought of as a dog whistle to voters who have lingering concerns about black political leadership. So that's from the 538 site. I myself, I have to say, was somewhat crestfallen when I found out that the Beagle isn't actually Warnock's dog. What can you do? So let me start by making three points about dog breeds and danger for us to keep in mind as we dive into some rabbinic texts, which are my area of specialization. So one, perceptions about animal danger are cult culturally constructed and shift over time. Two, these perceptions are related to our ideas about human identity, such as race. Three, perceptions about animal danger often mask our own accountability in cohabiting with dogs. And that's something I'm going to say more about as we go along. To put it simply for that last point, it's easier to blame the dog than to blame ourselves when something goes wrong. So let's keep those ideas on deck as we study several rabbinic texts. This is the first one. Here's the plan. We're, we'll first look at this Mishnah that deals directly with the problem of animal danger. And I'm going to suggest to you that there's a discourse of an animal danger in this text comparable to the discourses about pit bulls and Newfoundland with which I started. Then we're going to turn to a story in the Babylonian Talmud that's about dangerous animals. And I'm going to argue that the story is actually trying to get us to think critically about these discourses of danger and to take more seriously um, our own accountability um, in that danger. So what is really going on when we decide that something or someone is dangerous? That's kind of the big question for tonight. And I think the Talmudic story is inviting us to think hard about this question. So let's start with this Mishnah. Um, it's Mishnah Tractate Mavakama, Chapter 1, Mishnah 4. And just kind of bear with me because it's a quite complicated Mishnah. There are five innocent, the Hebrew word is Tom, and five attested, the Hebrew word is Muad. An animal is not attested with respect to goring, butting, biting, squatting, or kicking. The tooth is attested with respect to eating all that is appropriate to it. The foot is attested with respect to smashing as it walks. The attested ox, the ox who causes damage in the domain of the one damaged, and the human. The wolf, the lion, the bear, the leopard, the panther, the serpent, these are attested. Blood. Rabbi Elazar says, when they are domesticated, the Hebrew word is b'nei tarbut. They are, sorry, when they are domesticated, yeah, they are not attested. And the serpent, the nachash, is always attested. What is there? What's the difference between innocent and attested? Only that the innocent pays half of the damage 
from its own body, while the attested pays full damage from the upper sortie. So I realized that there was a lot going on there and we're going to unpack this piece by piece. So but let me first give you an overview of the Mishnah in case that's not entirely familiar. The Mishnah is a second and third century CE Jewish legal collection. It was composed in Hebrew in Roman Palestine. This particular Mishnah features animal tort law. The Mishnah distinguishes between cases in which the animal owner must pay full compensation for damages caused by their animal and cases in which the, in which the animal owner just has to pay half compensation. In the half compensation cases, the owner doesn't have to dip into their savings, but they pay only out of the value of the offending animal. Okay, so that's kind of the big picture. Now, let's go through step by step. The Mishnah starts with numbered lists, which is very typical for Mishnah chapters. They tend to start that way. So it, it says there's five Toms and five Muads. And I want to address the meaning of Tom and Muad in a minute. But before that, I actually want to observe that the structure is a little more complicated than the mission makes it out to be, since there's actually not two lists here, you might notice, but there's actually three lists. There's a list of um, muads, a list of toms, and then actually another list of muads. So there's something kind of funny about how this mission got composed and there's actually a lot of scholarship on that like you know process of composition so okay what do tom and muad mean i've translated them as innocent and attested but i promise you if you pulled out a bunch of mission translations you're going to see a lot of different possibilities the translators really struggle with these terms because they're complicated terms um i um, I want to delve into these terms because I think they're going to illuminate for us the Mishnah's discourse of animal danger. So, okay, my first question, is the Mishnah getting these terms from the Bible? And the answer to that question is kind of. So let's look at the biblical texts on which this Mishnah is drawing. Okay, here, oh, that's actually the, the mission Hebrew in case anybody wanted to be able to see it and in case we wanted to refer back to it. So, okay, our mission is drawing on Exodus 21 and 22. Um, now, Exodus uh, um, 21, 29. So I'm going to read this passage, but pay particular attention to verse 29 because we do have a version of the word nu'ad there which we're gonna to wanna to pay attention to. So, okay, here's the passage. When an ox gores a man or a woman to death, the ox shall be stoned and its flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox is not to be punished. If, however, that ox has been in the habit of goring and its owner, though warned, that's, that's the verb vehu'ad, has failed to guard it, and it kills a man or woman, the ox shall be stoned, and its owner too shall be put to death. When a man's ox injures his neighbor's ox, and it dies, they shall sell the live ox and divide its price. They shall also divide the dead animal. That's where the Mishnah gets the idea of half compensation. If, however, it is known that the ox was in the habit of goring, and its owner has failed to guard it, he must restore ox for ox, but shall keep the dead animal. Okay, so the Exodus passage kind of uh, looked at as a whole deals with two cases, an ox who kills a person and an ox who kills another ox. So, okay, here's, here's where I call upon you. 
I'm going to give you a series of, let's not call it quizzes because that's a little stressful. Let's call it just um, exercises. So here's the first exercise. Imagine you are living in ancient Israel and you're lucky enough to own an ox, but you're unlucky enough for your ox to, God forbid, gore a person to death. What happens to you? So if you could put that in the chat, I'd like to see the answer. I can repeat the question. You have an ox, the ox kills someone. What happens to you? Alan, I hope it's okay if I use first names. Yes, good. You're not punished. Your ox is a first time offender. Um, nothing happens to you. Yeah, exactly. So we're going to get to the first time, second time. But assuming it's a first time offender, yes, nothing happens to you. No punishment. Who is punished though? Which is fascinating. You could call it punishment. I, yes, I would call it punishment for being stoned. Yeah, the ox is actually punished. And in my book on animals in the Talmud, I actually have a whole chapter on judicial trials and punishment of animals, which is a really fascinating phenomenon that we find in medieval Europe and early modern Europe as well. Yeah, that's true that the owner is punished by the loss of the ox. They do, you know, that is, um, that is a lot. Okay, so next question. So what happens to you if someone had told you that your ox has a tendency to be aggressive? Yeah, thank you, Naomi. Good, Bobby. Good, Dara. You guys got it. Um, um, you uh, get the death penalty. You uh, you have um, a um, capital penalty for not having um, taken proper care of your ox. And when that homicide happens, you are fully liable and you are criminally executed. Now, just what the details in that warning isn't clear. I imagine someone saying, hey, yo, your ox is a little crazy, you know, you better watch that guy. But anyway, the basic idea is if the owner has that information, then the ante is upped. There's a greater degree of liability. If the owner has no such information, then he, he or she is less liable. Um, and the same holds true if the ox gores another ox. There's greater liability the more if the owner has information about the ox's personality, animality. Okay, so that's Exodus, which is the biblical backdrop for the Mishnah. How is our Mishnah relating back to Exodus? Now, let's go back. It's a subtle but noticeable shift. Um, the word huad, warned, it no longer refers, as it does in the Exodus, to whether a particular owner has been warned about their particular ox. The Misha instead turns huad into this more formal abstract term. And it creates this kind of antonym term, Tom, which we've translated innocence. And the two terms together are referring not to whether an owner has been warned or not, but whether an animal is exhibiting normal or abnormal behavior. So if we look again at the first list of odds, goring, butting, biting, squatting, kicking. Um, we see shifts. We're not talking about just an ox. We're talking about any animal who uses the term behemoth, which actually 
um, it intriguingly means mute. Um, the Mishnah applies the goring, um, the goring ox passage to, you know, other kinds of animals, as well as other kinds of aggression, not just goring, but other, other kinds of aggressive acts. So when the Mishnah declares the behema to be not mu'ad, tam, in other words, for goring, budding, all these things, the Mishnah is essentially telling us that's not normal. The Mishnah is it's following the same principle of liability as an exodus, that if you can't predict your animal's behavior, then you're not as liable for the harm that it causes. And to Eric, I'm relying on you as an injury lawyer to maybe give us some comparison to American law in our discussion later. But here, what's interesting, if you're looking at how the Mishnah is creatively developing the Bible, what we're seeing is that whereas for Exodus, predictability hinges on particular information that the owner either does or doesn't receive. But for the Mishnah, it's creating a kind of scheme of behavioral norms for animals. And I, I want us to look at how this scheme unfolds in the course of the Mishnah. So, okay, I'm going to give you your next exercise. You've traveled in time. You no longer live in ancient Israel. Now, you live in Roman Palestine, and you're a follower of this strange little movement called the rabbis. Now, if you're an ox, again, if you're lucky enough to have an ox, and it kicks a person, and it injures that person, what's your liability? Is it half, or is it full? Let me look at my chat to see your answers. Good. Tara, excellent. It's not full. It's half. Half. Good, Bobby. Good. Thank you for, for being brave enough to, you know, try and answer. I know it's, it's you know, it, it's injury law. It's complicated stuff. Yes. Um, you pay half because you could not have anticipated this kind of behavior. The average ox, according to the Mishnah, just doesn't go around kicking people, it's not your fault. Okay, so that's that. The Mishnah is going to contrast that now with abnormal, aggressive behavior. These, um, so, or, sorry, it's going to take that abnormal, aggressive behavior and contrast it to so-called normal behavior. And that's the Muad'Din. So, okay, let's start with the first two. The two is the tested with respecting to eating all that's appropriate to it. The foot is attested with respect to smashing as it walks. Okay, and I have to tell you this material gets really weird when you teach it because people start talking about tooth and foot as like tort categories and you forget that it even refers to a body part at all. So, okay. Now, what I want to point us to is another shift from the biblical materials. When Exodus talks about huad, it's referring to cases where an animal has exhibited aggressive behavior, remember. But when the Mishnah uses Muad, the related word, it's actually talking about cases where an animal is exhibiting non-aggressive behavior, just like humdrum walking around and eating stuff. Um, so for instance, the mission is going to go on to explain it if we had, you know, a multi-part series of, you know, study sessions about this, you'd see this. An animal can be expected to eat fruits and vegetables that appear in front of them or to break small objects that lie in his path. So, okay, here's the next exercise. You're walking your ox and your ox 
starts munching on a bag of apples that's sitting there. Was it your job to have prevented this? Do you need to pay full compensation? I'm going to my chat. Oh, a person. I know it's interesting kind of whose obligation is it to prevent damage? And I'm sure this must be the central animating question of any personal injury or tort law system, you know. It's, and this is how the mission falls on you questions. Alan, perfect, yes. Yeah, perhaps the apple should not have been there, but that is not what the mission is gonna say. The mission is gonna say, it's your job to expect that your animal is gonna eat a bunch of apples and it's your job to make sure that doesn't happen because you have every reason to expect. And trust me, when I walk bird, I keep him away from stuff that I know he's gonna damage because that is the smart thing to do. <laughs> okay, so um, now let's go to the third thing on the list. The third thing is weird. The attested ought, because that's the exodus case. Um, that's the one we already know, which actually clues us into the fact of how creative the mission is being, that now the actual case of the Exodus passage is just like one little case among a bunch of other cases that the mission has now been able to generate. Um, okay. But for this, it, just to understand the attested odds, where does that fit into the picture now? Well, this would be an ox who's exhibited abnormal behavior, such as goring, and the owner has been informed, which means for this ox, and I hope this isn't too complicated a way to say it, but the abnormal has become normal. It has shown itself to typically act atypically. And that's really the case that Exodus had in mind. So uh, I'm gonna skip number four, and for just a moment, skip number five, but let me just note, it's kind of fascinating that the human shows up in the midst of all this. Like what's the human doing here? How do we think of the human with respect to all these other animals? But the next list we get is of these, um, these other more sort of exotic animals. The wolf, the lion, the bear, the leopard, the panther, and the, I can't, I'm blocking my own view, the serpent, yes. These are attested. Um, except when they've been trained, according to Robbie Eliezer. But then the serpent, we say, well, you can't train a serpent. They're just always dangerous. So, okay, what, I just kind of gave it away. What's the real, what's the best translation of attested here? It's really dangerous. We're talking about dangerous animals, going back to my big theme. So unlike for domesticated animals where aggressive behavior is considered abnormal, for these species, aggressive behavior is considered normal. And this is really the discourse of animal breed specific or species specific danger with which I started. So, okay, your next exercise, make sure you're with me, is the following. Um, yeah, for, I think that's a good, I think that's a good argument maybe against the Mishnah. So, um, okay, so here you are. You, how many, does anybody here have a snake? I'm just curious about that. Um, okay, I don't think so. So, okay, say you have a pet snake and you're walking around with it. You know, I sometimes you see these people, you know, have snakes wrapped around them. Um, what if your snake bites someone? Are you responsible for paying full damages for that bite, according to the Mishnah?
Absolutely. Good, Bobby. Good, Alan. Good, Dale. Yeah, totally. Um, full damages. Because even if that snake, according to the mission, what about if it was here? I'll, I'll vary the exercise. What if it was um, your pet's panther? <laughs> Pet tiger. According to Rabbi Eliezer. Bobby's actually right there, not full damages. If it's drained, according to Rabbi Eliezer. Okay, I'm gonna move on from that. Um, I just did want to say one more thing about the human. One of the things I find kind of literarily intriguing about this Mishnah is that you could kind of link the human to what came before, or you could link the human to what came after. So the human could just be kind of a humdrum animal that just walks around and accidentally breaks stuff, kind of like, you know, the cow who breaks, you know, little jugs that it might kick in the you know ancient Roman marketplace? Or is the human more like the wolf, the lion, the bear, that's kind of like inherently aggressive and that's sort of ambiguous. It's kind of how dangerous should we think about the human? And I actually want to get back to that very point. So let me summarize what we've seen in the Mishnah before, and I'm just keeping track of time, um, before we go on to the Talmudic story. So I would spell out the implications of this Mishnah this way. Domesticated animals like the ox are normally not aggressive, but individually they may be. Some animal species are inherently aggressive, but individually they may not be. Some animal species are one is incorrigibly aggressive, possibly maybe the human being. So this is definitely an exercise in defining torts liability. That's the focus, is what do you have to pay? But I think it's also more than that. I, I wouldn't miss what this Mishnah is up to, which is creating a discourse about kind of animal, what's normal, what's abnormal, what's dangerous. Um, and I want to pay particular attention to how creatively it draws upon the Bible in order to do that. The Bible really doesn't have this discourse, at least in the same way. And I also want to notice that this discourse of danger is more complicated than maybe it might have initially seen. It organizes animals into this binary of domesticated and wild, but then it complicates that binary a few ways. It shows domesticated animals kind of walking around causing unwitting damage. It shows domesticated animals turning unpredictably aggressive. It shows some quote unquote dangerous animals proving to not always be that dangerous. Um, and that's kind of where I'm headed tonight, is that our ideas about danger start to break down when we scrutinize them. And I think that scrutiny is healthy. And that's really what the Talmudic story offers. And I want to turn to that story. Although to look at that story, we actually first should look at the um, Mishnah on which it's based, which is itself pretty interesting. So let me just get my slides up to us. Okay, so this is later in the same tractate. It's Mishnah Babakana chapter seven, Mishnah seven. Um, so far, we've been dealing with a category that the rabbis call Behemagasa, a big animal. And this is about Behemadzaka, which are smaller animals, um, like sheep and goats. So uh, let's see what it says. One may not raise small cattle, sheep and goats, in the land of Israel, but one may raise them in Syria and in the wilderness of the land of Israel. One may not raise chickens in Jerusalem because of the sacrifices and priests in the land of Israel because of the pure things, Kojim, or Tahara, sorry. An Israelite may not raise pigs anywhere 
a person may not raise a dog unless he's tied up by a chain. One may not set traps for pigeons unless it's 30 degrees, which is apparently like 40 miles from the inhabited areas. So, okay, this Mishnah discusses sheep, goats, chickens, pigs, dogs, pigeons. Exercise for you, you're a Jew living in Jerusalem in Roman Palestine. What animals are you allowed to have on your farm? Large cattle, good. Yeah, we got that. And it's interesting why they're okay with large cattle. But goats, um, if you're, goats, it depends where you are. You kind of got to be out in the boonies if you want to have goats. What else can you have on your farm? Anything? Sheep, dogs. They don't talk about ducks. They talk a dog that's tied up. Good. Um, good. Chickens. Not if you're in Jerusalem, actually. That's kind of why I posed the Jerusalem question. So basically, there's not a whole lot of animals you can actually have on your farm. It's really kind of just a dog if you tie the dog up. Or we, oh, actually, another thing is pigeon, as long as you caught the pigeon far away from where you live or for where anybody lives. So it's actually a surprisingly um, large variety of animals. You can't keep sheep, goats, chickens, pigs. And um, if you're surprised by that, you're not alone. So are a lot of scholars who have speculated why the Mishnah is opposed to these really typical, like what farm have you ever been to that doesn't have some combination of these animals? Like none. So, you know, why? Why would the Mishnah take this hardline stance on these, you know, average farm animals? So there's actually a lot of theories running out there. I'm kind of, I don't want to take up too much time. I'm kind of curious to have you guess. That would be sort of fun to see what you'd come up with. But I'll just tell you that one of the reasons is actually a similar reason for, for um, contemporary vegetarianism, which is that animals take up a lot more resources than growing plants. And so it's, to, it's like a com conservationist kind of approach. But the other, the other theory is that these animals create a lot of conflicts. We already saw a lot of the conflicts that can come up. So that that was the concern. Um, but I do want to just say it's clear from other rabbinic texts that, um, that nobody listened to these restrictions. So Rabbi Bolton, I'm sure your congregation listens, hangs on to every word you say and listens to everything. <laughs> but Back then, not so much, and um, and it seems pretty clear people did um, did have these animals. And there's actually other rabbinic texts that are much less restrictive than the mission is. So, um, okay, here's my question to you: Which common household? And now I have to go back to the chat. Oh, no chickens left. Okay, good, good. Um, that would be a little chaotic and messy. Um, so which common household animal did you not see on that list? Yes, good, 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 Alan, good deal. Thanks. Cats, where's cats? So, okay, we're going to turn to cats right now. And I feel I need to give a disclaimer that um, if you're like a hardcore cat lover, you are not going to enjoy the following story. 
and I, I actually like cats, but I don't enjoy the following story either. So that's, that's like, you know, trigger warning. Okay. So in the episode we're about to look at, um, I, tr I tried to accompany the stories with, with nice pictures. So um, in this story from Baba Kama, we have three rabbis, Rav, Shmuel, Babylonian rabbis, and Rav Ozzi. So we've kind of also traveled forward in time. They're all trying to enter the house of a baby boy who's being celebrated. And here's what happens. Rav, Shmuel, and Rav Ozzi happen to come to the house of a week of the sun, which is a circumcision. Or some say it was the house of a salvation of the sun, which is probably a pidyon haben. Rav would not enter before Shmuel. Shmuel would not enter before Rav Asi. Rav Asi would not enter before Rav. They said, who will go behind? Shmuel should go behind. And Rav and Rav Asi should go. But Rav and Rav Asi should have gone behind. Rav was only making a gesture on Shmuel's behalf. Because of the incident where he cursed him, Rav took it upon himself. In the meanwhile, a cat came and mutilated the hands of the child. Rav went out and expounded. It's permitted to kill a cat and forbidden to raise it. Theft does not apply to it, nor does the obligation to return a lost item to its owners. Okay, so I Talmudic stories are weird. So if you didn't catch all that, you know, I, I, I get it. So let me lay out six elements of the story. So first, these three rabbis arrive at this celebration. They can't decide, the element two, they can't decide who, to go for, who should go first. Element three, they finally do decide and go in. Four, in the meantime, the narrator interrupts the story to ask a question about, oh, actually, no, I, I meant to, that's the next thing. The narrator interrupts the story to ask a question about how they decided who should go. And they give this background thing about Rob cursing. Then in the meantime, we are told that a cat bites the hand of the baby and severely injures him. And then Rob comes out with this whole new legislation about cats. So, okay, a number of strange things happening in the story. I want to take you through the story Wait, Rabbi Bolton, could I just ask you, what time do you think would be good for me to stop talking? I, th I think you're definitely, um, you could take till 8.30, then open okay. up for dialogue, 8.35, and open it up for questions and comments. Okay, I'll, I'll aim for that, great. Sound good? Sound good. Okay. So, so I'll, let me take you through the story and then I will try to wrap up. So uh, the story begins with this, what I think is an irrelevancy. Is it a bris? Is it opinion of Ben? Like, who cares? So I actually like to read Talmudic stories in a kind of literary way. And the way I read this is that the story dwells on this seemingly tangential point to focus us, the story audience, on the boy and to contrast our focus on the boy with the main character's negligence regarding the boy. The three rabbis are like totally caught up in their hierarchical relationships and like, you know, who should go in first and the boys, you know, beside the point. So, okay, what is happening with those three rabbis? So according to the rules of the rabbinate, and I'm sure in your congregation you observe these, that um, no rabbi should enter room for a rabbi of greater honor. And in this case, it kind of brings them to a comic standstill. Rob won't enter before Shmuel, Shmuel won't enter, you know, blah, blah, blah. They each won't enter before, before the other and nobody can move. So they realize they're in this predicament. You can kind of picture this, like they're all like sort of, you know, jammed into the door and nobody can go first. And they ask like, who's going to hang back? Like, we got to figure this out. So at that point, they decide Shmuel should defer to the others 
And the editorial voice in the story is like, why Rob or Rob Ozzy, um should have gone behind? And basically what they're referring to is this other incident that gets narrated elsewhere in the Talmud where um, Rav gets this terrible stomach ache. It's a very funny story or kind of weird story. And Shmuel cures Rav, but he does so by feeding him all this food and then not letting him go to the bathroom. And it's like this really bad scene. So um, Rav cursed Shmuel. And then in this story, he feels bad about cursing him. And that's why he wants Shmuel to go ahead of him, even though Rob has like the right to go ahead of him. So that's kind of the background. Again, I like to read these stories almost like literature. And in my reading, they bring up this other story to point to a couple of things. First of all, that Rob is kind of an angry guy. Like he goes around cursing people and you better watch out and not cross him. And the other is that like the rabbis, like all their honor and kind of micro power struggles, that that can like go bad really fast and quickly turn it into to curses into something bad. So in the meantime, they're all preoccupied with these questions of honor. We can imagine the guests and the family are too, that the cat attacks the baby that they're all there to celebrate. And you know, you can only imagine how tragic and shocking this must have been. So what's the rabbinic response? Well, Rav emerges with all these really harsh legislations about cats. Now, if it were you or I in this situation, how might we have handled the situation? Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna like do a little less interactive stuff, I think, so I can get through some of this material and wrap up. So I think if it were me, I would probably say, let's be more careful about leaving babies around when we have cats in the house, you know? I wouldn't like take it all out on cats and say like cats are evil, like let's kill them when we have the chance. So, um, so okay. Here's where like cat lovers can come back into the talk because I think the Talmud actually agrees with me and is trying to lead us to exactly this conclusion that discourses of animal danger are a strategy that we humans use for a variety of purposes. And I think in this case, it's actually to deflect blame from the rabbis who are literally paralyzed by their preoccupation with their honor. And Rob's legislation kind of shifts attention away from that. And uh, I'm gonna take you more quickly through the rest of the Talmudic material because it's kind of complicated, but I just wanna show you, I think the point it makes. So in the next section, this is right after, the Talmud keeps asking like, why did Rob keep like, why is there so much redundancy in Rob's legislation? Like, if he said it's permitted to kill a cat, why did he also say that you can't raise a cat? And so on and so forth. And I think the point here is they're trying to say Rob kind of, you know, went a little too far here. He was like a little zealous in the way he presented these legislations. Um, okay. And then what happens is the Talmud has more to say about Rob's legislations. And what you're about to see is that according to the, what happens is the Talmud brings up an early rabbinic teaching that actually really likes cats and says, you can raise a cat, that's no problem. They're good to have around the house. They clean up the house. So that's a contradiction. Nobody likes contradictions, but the Talmud really doesn't like contradictions, especially between an early authoritative rabbinic teaching and a later, what they call a mora. That's what Rob was. So, you know, what are the different strategies of resolving a contradiction? Well, here what we get is the classic okimta. You say one teaching is talking about X, the other teaching is talking about Y. In this case, we say, and this is kind of interesting, that the bad cat in the Rob story 
was actually a white cat and good cat that the teaching was talking about, Richio and Elazar, is actually black cats. So for the Talmud, black cats are actually the good kinds and white cats are actually the bad kind. But then what you'll see is this starts to get really murky and they say, well, they actually know um, that the cat in the Rob story was white, but sorry, was black and not white. Sorry, see the black white stuff starts getting me really confused. So they say, oh yeah, fine. That cat was um, white, but it was actually like the son of a black cat. So we're good after all. And then the Gemara just keeps kind of playing with these permutations of ancestry. Um, like it says, well, the cat the rub story couldn't really be what you just said because this later Rabbi Ravina asked about precisely that case and he wouldn't have asked if we already had a teaching about it. So we correct it to say that actually um, the, the bright is talking, let me see if I get this right. Um, the, uh, uh, here. That, okay, which one? The Gemara concludes that the story of Rav involves a black cat born of a white cat who was in turn born of a white cat. And that's the kind you have to watch out for. Okay, so if you're confused, obviously so is I. And um, here's what I want to end with. The question we're left with is that how could you possibly know what kind, you'd need like a pet DNA test to know which kind of gap you were really dealing with. Um, and I think implicit here is a critique of the discourse of animal danger. There's really a fine line distinguishing the safe animal from the dangerous one. And I think the Gemara is maybe kind of parodying this whole black and white discourse. Um, and so I wanna get back to the idea that maybe it's humans that are really the dangerous animal on the list. And that in this story, the real danger came from the people who were negligent and who weren't paying attention and allowed this cat to attack the baby. Um, okay, so uh, let me end then with some conclusions about danger and some conclusions about animals. So I want to close with the idea that this past year, we've been engaged in a lot of new modes of what I would call risk reflection, a lot of new kinds of risk and danger. One comes from the pandemic. We're facing new risk calculations every day. Do you go to the grocery store? Do you visit your elderly parents? You know, all the time weighing risks. But the other way we've been thinking, I think in new ways about risk and danger is with respect to Black Lives Matter and racial justice activism. As a society, we're coming to reckon with how dangerous it is to be Black in this country and how dangerous Black people are perceived to be in this country. I mean, talk about black and white cats. We have a problem with black and white in our country. Um, that's much bigger. And the, the pandemic and racial justice obviously intersect. We know black people have been hit much harder by the pandemic and that Asians have been blamed for the pandemic. So I think we need to think a lot about who we perceive as dangerous who's actually in danger, and we need to adjust our decision-making to address risk in more self-aware ways. And I think the story in the Talmud kind of gets us going in that direction. But I also wanna draw some conclusions about risk and animals. I think the Talmud also helps us think in new ways about animals, which animals do we perceive as dangerous and why? In what ways do those perceptions kind of mask our own insufficiencies and also the danger we pose to animals, not just the dangers they pose to us. So I think we not only should be thinking about racial justice, but also species justice. And so I'll just close. You may know that Isaac Bashevis Singer is a famous vegetarian. Jonathan Safran Foer has gotten really involved in animal activism. What you may not know is that in the academy, 
there's an entire new field called animal studies, which is in every area of the academy. The French philosopher, who I might add is Jewish, Jacques Derrida is one of the major figures, so is Peter Singer. Jewish studies scholars like myself are trying to bring our work into dialogue with animal studies, and we now have a lot of great Jewish studies work in animal studies from Bible to Hasidic Ashkenaz, the medieval Jewish pietist, to modern Yiddish and Hebrew literature. And I just gave you a case study in rabbinic, but there's a lot of great Jewish studies, animal studies work out there. I'm currently working on a project on something I'm calling the animal family laws of the Torah. I won't say what those are, but it, feel free to ask me about them. I'm happy to tell you about that project and also to talk more about the ideas and texts that I showed you tonight. So I'll stop. And let me uh, stop here. Okay. So I'm gonna turn my view back to gallery view and thank Dr. Berkovitz for a engaging read of rabbinic texts, claims about their connect Activity with some of what's embroiled this society, matters and issues that we are contending with today, and welcome some comments, uh, respectful uh, reflections, and Talmudic reflections at that, since we're in Talmudic literature and allowing for us to think about some of the constructs that were suggested and potentially the constructs that were presented tonight. Um, my first, as you think about that, and as we get set to allow people to come off mute, um, my first reflection, Dr. Berkowitz, is that the wonderful nature of you are pointing out that the Talmud has us construct our own reality and our own perceptions of what and who is dangerous right, also can lead us to reflect not only on the people who we consider to be dangerous, the animals we consider to be dangerous, but also potentially on the ideas that are dangerous. It seems to me that some of the constructs that we assume are working towards justice may indeed be undermining them. And this is not to completely be entirely challenging all you suggested, but it is that we, 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 we situate ourselves as Jews with a value statement such as all people are created in the image of God, and yet there are so many people working on constructing categories and constructs of, uh, to put it squarely, of uh, racial justice systems that I'm not sure we haven't also really started to stir ourselves into categories that need to be as blurry as the black and white cat's offspring. And so I just present that as a potential way of reading our own set of categories and some of the absurdity that seems to be going on with redefining, let's say, the, uh, the, the nature of our own approach to a system where, wherein we hoped, even if we couldn't be there in its pure form, for the equality of all within the borders of our, of our own nation. So I present that in a Talmudic way because these are important matters to think about quite Talmudically. And if anything tonight, I'm totally inspired by the way that you've helped us put up as potentially undermining the very categories that we sometimes create, like the rabbis of the Mishnah create, very different from the Torah wisdom that we might have applied, and where it says that human beings are really at fault, not the animals. So that's that's my initial take. Uh, others with with comments, questions, or do you want to react to, to something that I've said before we start the dialogue with the community? Yeah, I'll just say quickly that I, I like I like what you said about ideas being dangerous. I hadn't thought about that actually with respect to this material, but there's a whole um, rabbinic discourse about heresy that um, 
and you know ideas that are dangerous that I think would be interesting to put in, into dialogue with this material. And yeah, I really like what you said at the end about, and that's something I love um, to look at in my work is, you know, what's going on in the Bible, what's going on at, at this level of the Mishnah, what's going on in the Talmud in different ways and the kind of internal just development, creativity, but also critique. And what I especially like in just the particular things I showed you tonight is I think how powerful stories can be as critiques and in subtle ways. Like the story I showed you, I read it as a critique. You don't have to read it that way. I'm not, I don't, I think very few people read it that way, but I think stories, um, there's so many different ways to read them. And I think they're a really powerful site for cultural critique. So if you'll just uh, raise your hand or we can do a little bit of uh, thoughtful sharing and questions for Dr. Berkowitz now. I'd like to open it to the community here. Can I do this? Bobby? Can I, yeah, can I speak? Thank you so much, uh, Professor. This was really interesting and um, you walked us through it in a very logical way uh, until we got to things that were illogical. But at any rate, <laughs> along the way, it was very logical. So I just wanted to end um, to offer a personal story in consideration of Rob's approach to the cat. Because in our family, when my grandson was very little, um, the parents had their first child was a dog that they uh, lavished a lot of attention to. And when the baby came, the dog was getting jealous and the dog was starting to, um, you know, nip at the baby and they gave the dog away. So they didn't do the extreme things that Rob did, but they didn't want to trust the dog around the baby if they weren't going to be there all the time. So it's not that outlandish to, you know, get rid of the offensive animal. Yeah, I'm totally sympathetic. I think that's the responsible thing to do, actually, and would avoid the kind of thing we saw in Rob's story, where you have something catastrophic happen. And in that case, you know, I think, I, you know, somebody should have intervened and said, we need to keep these people, we need to keep the animal apart from the baby. And sometimes you have to make hard choices. I have friends. I have friends who lived down in North Carolina who had a dog they loved, but the dog kept attacking people. And ultimately they actually put the dog, I, I hate the euphemism, like put the dog down. And, you know, I had a hard time not blaming them, but I saw how much they suffered at having to do, I, I think it raises really difficult questions because, the animal needs to be saved, but people need to be saved. We all need to be responsible. And it, it ends up posing these really tough choices. Okay, thank you. I won. Um, Eric, I, Eric, go ahead. Yeah, um, I was in the middle, but I stopped typing. Uh, I was gonna bow out early on Socratic method questions from you about um, uh, relationships um, among strangers, I, I, most of the law I practice, um, not matrimonial, that's the like, ultimate relationship, but business relationships and um, contracts, fiduciary duties. Um, this opened up my mind really to um, relationships um, among strangers, um, which sounds to me at first glance to be a bit of an oxymoron, but um, I think this opened my mind up to um, that uh, strangers need to be in, in relationship to each other. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you for yeah, that. thanks, Eric. Yeah, I don't know how much the Mishnah or the Talmud assumes about whether people in these cases know each other or don't know each other. I tend to think like what they're imagining are kind of busy commercial areas where it's like hard to predict what's gonna happen. 
and you kind of have to anticipate kind of like if we are on the subway, if we ever get there again and, um, you know, like you got to take care of your stuff and be kind of defensive about things that obviously the mission doesn't have that in mind, but some kind of busy commercial place where it's actually not, not people who know each other. But um, I think that's not, that's one of the interesting shifts like, actually from Exodus to uh, the Mishnah is that Exodus, I think, does presume that people know each other and that you're dealing with these small communities. People know whose animal is whose. And then you get, um, I was just saying in the chat, and then in the Mishnah, I think that's one of the reasons things shift so much in the missions, they're dealing with this really different uh, socioeconomic reality that's much less familiar. But what you said actually made me think also about like mask wearing and how much, um, how much strangers have an effect on you when you're walking around and kind of their choices and the way they impact you and your choices and kind of the way you make your choices based on how you think it affects other people. And I, I've been obsessed with that since the pandemic started is I walk around on the streets and just constantly am looking like who's wearing a mask, who's not, and how does that differ by neighborhood and by ethnicity? And it's, it's like really fascinating how much people take those kinds of things into, a, into account. You have a couple of questions in the chat, Dr. Berkowitz. Yeah, okay, so let me check that out. Let's see. Great. Back to Randy Feld's question, which is post to the dialogue about the Talmudic sources. Okay, yeah, because I missed some of the earlier ones that are interesting. I'll have to look at these. You mean, where does the Talmud stand on animal rights? Yeah. Yeah, so, oh man, I have so much to say about that. Um, what about when humans are cruel to animals? Seems like the Tal Talmud only views animals as human property. I, you know, I, I've looked, there's like one classic place where the, there's like the term is tsar ba'alechayim, the suffering. They usually translate that as the animal suffering. And there's one key source in Baba Metzia that really has this lengthy discussion about it. And there's some interesting scholarship by rabbis and others. And if I had to sum it up, and it's hard to sum up Jewish law on anything, but summing up the Talmud and that particular sugya, I would say it's like one value among other values. And I think you're right that fundamentally animals are property. And luckily, treating animals well is also treating property well. You know, like sometimes, like if your ox dies, that's like a loss of property to you. So it's a lot of the same issues raised by slavery. You know, um, there's a lot of overlap in that if you treat creatures too terribly, they won't thrive and they won't be able to do the work you want them to do. But if you don't really think of them as people or as creatures who have equality, you're not going to give them the same kind of care you would give yourself. So what happens is something in between where you don't want to torture them or make them suffer. That's immoral, but it also goes against your financial interests. But then you're not going to give them the same level of care that you would give yourself. And that's kind of, to me, my impression of where the Talmud falls out on that. I'll stop there. I think that's so good. That that passage in the Talmud is really complex and interesting mm. in what it has to say about animal suffering. But I'll just say this: I don't buy that. Like it's as simple as Judaism cares a lot about animal suffering. And it's this big value. It is a value, but it's a more complicated story than that. Yeah. Yeah. There's another so, one in the chat, and then. Laura and Ira have a comment or a question. So why don't Ira, you? Go ahead. No, no. Ira, Laura, go ahead, and then we'll take the one yes. in the chat afterwards. 
our, our dog Pablo wants to know why dogs were looked down upon in the Bible or in ancient Israel so much. Why, why was there such negative treatment of, of animals in the Bible? I don't, uh, dogs. Yes, dogs, dogs. Oh, Agree. Dogs get a really bad rap in the Bible. And in kind of like Judeo, the Judeo-Persian period, things kind of change around the book of Tobit. I, that's like an apocryphal book that made it into the Christian Bible. It's a Jewish book, but it didn't make it into the Jewish Bible, where you have actually a trusty dog partner as part of the story. But there's no question that, that the Bible is very negative about dogs. And that seems to be because they're associated with like carrion and blood and, you know, eating with dead stuff. Mm. Dead stuff. Because as a digression, I don't know if you saw Stiesel, in one episode, there was the dog. Yeah, very I, 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 yeah <laughs> I've seen like some of Stiesel, I'm trying to remember if I saw the dog episode. The grandfather, yeah, very, yeah, the, grandfather, seen... the grandfather puts the dog in a shopping bag because his grandson wants the dog. He didn't like dogs at first, but he puts after the dog it. after he liked it. Uh, oh, that's funny. I could, I could totally see that. Um, that's funny. Thank you for your question. Yeah, but uh, oh, I just want to say that there's a great collection called The Dog in Jewish History, or the, I think it's called The Dog in Jewish History by a scholar named Philip Ackerman Liebe. Phil, Philip Ackerman, I could leave I, I could probably get that to you, but it covers all of Jewish history. It talks about dogs and like Yiddish literature. Um, it, it, talks about dogs in the medieval period like it's got everything and it has a bunch of articles treating dogs in the bible and you're absolutely right it, dogs dogs get a really bad rap in the bible so so back to the uh chat where uh benjamin marcus wrote in yes i'm just looking there's camera tech issues so no problem uh -huh. i wonder whether you think the talmud itself is or means to be as flexible in who it wants to allow to interpret its lessons and according to some changing culture of those whose period its interpreters live or is it possible that the Talmud means to be universal and offering or requiring a certain more abstract set of deductions or prescriptions for how to live and be together as a social group of fallible humans that's really interesting. I don't think the Talmud ever meant for me to read it. <laughs> I think it was like an internal text for the rabbis in Babylonia. And so I do think it's an internal discourse. And maybe that's why it does such interesting things. Maybe it would have been more cautious if it was trying to be more universal. You know, the more people you try to speak to, probably the less, the less sincere and honest and open you are. But um, yeah, and it continues to be read by so by, to be read by so many different people. I mean, in the academy, we kind of do our thing, and there's a lot of great scholarship on Talmudic stories. Jeff Rubenstein at NYU is kind of the scholar who who does a lot of work on rabbinic. Talmudic stories. Daniel Boyarin at Berkeley has done great work on kind of sex and gender in Talmudic story. There's a lot of great work, but I don't think the rabbis in, you know, eighth century Babylonia knew we were going to be doing this. But that's how literature works, you know. I think once literature is out there, um, you know, anybody could read it, but I think the printing press made a big difference. You know, a lot of big things happened in history that, that made literature more democratic than it ever was in late antiquity or the Middle Ages. So, I, so yeah, so, uh, okay, sorry, so who is next? I mean, I'm really enjoying the chat, but I don't want to skip anyone. But I'll, I'll just say, Dara is definitely right. We were supposed to be vegetarians until now. We were. That's when things change. 
I mean, there's a great book by a scholar named Ken Stone on animals in the Hebrew Bible. That's just wonderful. I couldn't recommend it more. Wonderful. The uh, question that came up in the chat, and uh, maybe we'll end with this. Did, did humans make that list because you think the rabbis think that we're inherently danger, dangerous? And uh, Sherman and Naomi kind of asked this question. I think I've got it right. And, and if that's really the, not the flavor of Sherman or Naomi, you should chime in here and, and say what, what, your, what your question is. Um, I was just thinking about how so often when we do see animals exhibit aggressive behavior, how pit bulls have received this sort of reputation, um, I mean, I just can't help but ask myself, is, is it the animal that's actually born dangerous or is it the environment that has nurtured this aggression? And I think we can say that about people too, you know, just being exposed to really horrific conditions, whether it's starvation, neglect, sort of just this, this uh, fight, fight for your life mentality, you know? And I mean, of course it's different when we also see cases of this like at SeaWorld where a whale attacked, of course, it's a, it's a wild animal. Like you can't expect that sort of any other behavior from a whale, you know? But I think that when we're talking about dogs and cats and other household animals um, that have been domesticated, I think um, we're, we're not thinking about that enough because like you said, that there are people who do euthanize their animals when they do attack rather than maybe they just need to be relocated um, and put into an environment that's more healthy for them. And I just think that that's something that wasn't necessarily factored into any of the texts that we looked at tonight. Um, for me, it was maybe a little too black and white, um, but yeah, I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, I'm so glad you said that's such a, that's such a great way to end because that's really how I'm thinking too. And where I want the Talmudic text to push us because it's, um, it's just so easy to blame. And I, I think the Talmud is criticizing that. But then the next question is, well, what do you do? And I actually skipped a section where I was going to say, well, you may be thinking, well, aren't some animals dangerous? You know, like, don't we need to protect ourselves? Like, that's real. And you really put your finger on it. Is yes, that's real. But we need to create an infrastructure and kind of change the whole system so that that doesn't become problematic. So mm. yes, there's danger. Like, yes, there are real dangers, no question. Humans can be dangerous. Animals can be dangerous. But we need to have structures in place so that harm doesn't get caused. And I'm actually, this is maybe a totally random association. I'm reading a book about, I'm trying to remember what it's called, but it's about a family with 12 kids. I think 10 of them are schizophrenic. Is anybody else reading that book? It's, it's oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. but, um, but there's a lot of um, discussion of what causes schizophrenia. Mm. Is it like the mother? Is it the environment? Because the old fashioned explanation was like that, you know, the mother caused it. But then it's, is it environment or is it biology? And then, you know, it seems to be some combination. And, you know, I don't know if Sarah's still here. She definitely talked to the Sarah Clagsburn, who's a psychiatrist. But, um, but it seems clear that, that the answer is we need to have systems that will help people. And that whether it's inherent or whether it's from the environment and the likelihood is, is that it's a combination is that we need to have ways to resolve it that aren't going to lead to more problems and more danger. And kind of my reading of that Rob story is that's just a way to clamp down and create more problems. That's not, I mean, I think we, I, I, I won't get political, but I think what we've seen is short term easy solutions are not the answer. They do, it's not, it, it doesn't get rid of the problem. You need long term thoughtful solutions that really address the deeper problems. And the deeper problems here are yes, people can be aggressive, yes, animals can be aggressive, but how can we work around that so that it doesn't cause a baby to be, you know, mutilated at their very own risk?
Yeah. All right. We're going to take one last thought or question, Diane or Aaron, and okay. then we're going to say uh, thank you and let Dr. Berkowitz go back to her uh, university classes and, and life uh, otherwise, but we, we really do thank you for hanging in there with us right to the, the last drop of what I promised a 9, a 9 p.m. stop. Thank you. <laughs> so I, I think you really just touched on it and it, it really is um, this combination of nature and nurture so that we know that there are people who breed pit bulls to be aggressive, but we also know that there are put pit bulls that are puppies and they're, and they're not aggressive unless they're bred that way or allowed to be that way. So it, again, it's, it's a nature nurture uh, combination. And I think it's the same with people that, you know, we know that there are people who need nurturing in order to help them deal with whatever their aggressive tendencies might be. That's a perfect truth, I think, to end this session on. I couldn't agree more. And um, yeah, I think that's, that makes a lot of sense. Maybe in some cases, there's a little more nature. In some cases, there's a little more nurture. But how could, how could never, you know, both of those things not be important? Dr. Berkowitz, I want to thank you for such an engaging lecture tonight. Uh, in, a, in a long list of preeminent scholars that we've had at our lectures, for our Lucy lectures, you, you now stand uh, as someone who's really done something entirely new. Here's what's new about rabbinic literature, folks. We, 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 we got part of Nazikim, part of the Talmud about damages, going on a screen to then talk about nature and nurture of humanity, human hearts, minds and souls to help us really refine what we take for granted as categories and what who and who we put into categories how we define danger and possibility and get to ultimately a conversation about moral agency of every individual and that's i think part of what the rabbis might have expected if it leaked out if the talmud did leak out that, that that's a good Jewish way of reading and thinking about and Talmudically debating the very elements of Mishnah and Talmud itself. And so uh, thank you for leading us in such an engaging lecture tonight. Really, really appreciate your preparation, spending time with us, teaching us, and good luck with the, your continued work in this field and, and your other endeavors. Thanks, Eric. Thank you so much. That was, that was such a lovely summary. Yes, thanks, Eric and Sarah. This is a great introduction you made. Thanks to everyone who listened so attentively and had such interesting responses. And that was a perfect summary. And I, I wish everyone to stay well, be well. Take care. Nice meeting you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, Bye everyone. everyone. Take good Bye, care. Bye. 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 Thank you. Lila Tuck.